also really nice to see that some of the people I've only met online actually have legs and feet. Um, it's quite lovely, really. I will also say that the last, the before last Briar lecture, and this would have been the ninth Briar lecture had we not had to drop the one where we had invited in 2020 Hina Gilani um, as I think the first event. Peter Slot from the Dutch Embassy remembers vividly how hard we worked on that. And we, it was the first event that we had to drop. And this is, I'm told, the first event that we are doing with actual live people again. So in some ways, we are coming full circle here, which is a good thing. And I'm really pleased uh, so many of you have um, chosen to come here in person. It's great. We hope to have a great discussion with you. We are immensely grateful to the Embassy of the Netherlands and to Ambassador Haspels, who is sitting in front of me, and the Municipality of The Hague, represented by Pepin Zagman, who's sitting over there. And the embassy is also represented by my friend Peter Slort um, for their efforts and their support of this lecture series from the beginning. We could not have done this without your support, and we're really pleased because of the history of the city of The Hague, its century-old commitment to international law and international justice to be doing this series together. It couldn't be a more perfect partnership. And we also profoundly appreciate their abiding respect for the value that we place on our independence. Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, Stephen Breyer, after whom this series is named and who gave the very first lecture in 2014, unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but I have sent him all the details and the links um, to the conference in case he wants to watch it. It's also my great honor and personal pleasure to introduce this year's speaker, Philippe Sanz. Philippe, whom I've known since we were students at Harvard together, um, is professor at law, of law at University College London and the Samuel and Judith Pizar visiting professor at Harvard Law School and a practicing barrister, barrister, and his lecture today is titled Crimes Against Humanity, Genocide and Ecocide of Rights, Responsibilities and International Order. Thank you, Philippe, for joining us for this lecture. Um, after Philippe's lecture, he will be joined for a brief conversation with my colleague, Ted Picone, sitting over here, a non-resident senior fellow in the Center for Security, Strategy and Technology in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings, and that's a mouthful, and Chief Engagement Officer at the World Justice Project, and I will say, um, the person who first originated this lecture, lecture series um, here at Brookings and who shepherded it through and then handed it off to me when he left us for Pastures Greener. Um, and their conversation will be followed by a panel discussion featuring um, three really distinguished experts of international law, Diane Amman, Regents Professor of International Law and Emily and Ernest Woodruff Chair in International Law at the University of Georgia School of Law, um, Sean Murphy, Manat Ahn, Professor of International Law at George Washington University Law School, and Jane Stromseth, uh, Francis Cabell Brown, Professor of International Law at Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. And today's event, as always, reflects only the views of the speakers themselves. I would like to perhaps, if I may, add on a personal level, some of you know I used to be, I'm a lawyer by training and, and worked for a journalist as a long time. And because I was a lawyer, um, my paper where I started on April 7th, 1994, the day after the beginning of the Rwandan genocide, was decided in Hamburg. And our Africa correspondent was on holiday, um, gave this to me as a topic. And I ended up covering uh, the genocide in Rwanda, uh, genocide in the Balkans, the tribunals in Arusha and, in, uh, and for Yugoslavia and The Hague, and finally the ICC negotiations in 1998. And I have seen both the conflicts that originated these trials and, and the legal negotiations arising out of them. And I am, of course, also German and the child of war children. And so for me, in the events that are currently occurring in Ukraine, a lot of things are coming full circle. I don't know about you. I have spent a lot of time rage crying, to be honest. Um, this goes deeply, not just to my principles, uh, my sense of morality, but also to my emotions. I cannot, I cannot deny that. And I'm really glad that we have managed to make time for this topic and this event today because I think it's a really fitting topic for us all to be returning to Brookings with because this institution has always been committed to making the world a better place. And I think this might be one of the ways that we can try and do this all together. But before giving you the, the, the floor, Philippe, I will turn things over to the Dutch ambassador to the United States, Mr. Andre Haspels, and deputy mayor, uh, and followed, following him, a short video by the deputy mayor of The Hague, Saskia Bruyners, for some words of welcome. Please, ambassador. Good morning.
morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us for the eighth uh, annual Justice Breyer Lecture. Less, of course, than 24 hours after the historic appointment of the first black woman to the Supreme Court, to Kutangi Brown Jackson. And it's not lost on me that she is replacing the retiring Justice Breyer. And we are here for a lecture <clears throat> named in his honor. We're also, as has been said already, uh, for the second time uh, in a straight years uh, digitally, online, which is great. So in that way, we can reach a bigger audience. This year's topic, it has already been mentioned, is crimes against humanity, genocide and ecocide of rights, responsibilities and international order. And it's especially meaningful, <coughs> meaningful considering Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This aggression has caused a geopolitical crisis with which world leaders are still grappling and probably will in the foresee foreseeable future. And let me also take this opportunity to show my solidarity with the brave people of Ukraine. Of course, the Netherlands is in full support of the sanctions that have been uh, announced. And we have also, like many other countries in Europe and across the world, opened our borders for refugees. As a symbol of, of, of our support as well, we have raised next to the Dutch flag the Ukrainian flag at our residence. And I really hope that the uh, conflict will be solved peacefully and soon. But Constanza, I share your frustration, frustration when it comes to not only the frustration, but also the sadness about what's currently happening. And uh, to be honest, I don't see an, an easy off-ramp on the short term if I look at the conflict now. But with Ukraine in our minds, I think it is more important than ever for us to talk about the international legal order. The Kingdom of the Netherlands strongly believes that advancing the international rule of law is crucial to a fair and just world. And it's for that reason that we have anchored that idea in our constitution. So Article 90, uh, translated in Dutch, reads, the government shall promote the development of the international legal order. No city in the world evokes the noble <laughs> ideas of peace and justice like The Hague in the Netherlands. It's the legal capital of the world, and it's the city of peace is justice, and that's what we are known for. We have more than 14,000 people working and more than 130 international uh, institutions and organizations to advance world peace every day. The Hague owes its international reputation as legal capital of the world and international city of peace and justice to the presence of international courts and tribunals. And one of the six principal functions of the United Nations is based in The Hague, the, U the UN International Court of Justice, which makes us one of the top ranking cities in UN cities in the world. But we also work on promoting international legal order outside our national borders. In fact, our support to the Stephen Breyer lecture today is an example of that. And today, as has been said, more than ever, it is important for us to come together to exchange views and ideas about the current challenges to our democracies, to our way of living, to the international rule of law, and to the infringements of human rights. We are a small country, but we are strongly committed to the international rule of law. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I have proudly served as The Hague's Deputy Mayor for International Affairs for five years now. In that time, I have often been asked to reflect on international law. It cannot be denied, the field has made immense strides forward the last 75 years. I am proud of the role of my city, The Hague, with its many international courts and tribunals, has played in that progress. But since the end of February, we have witnessed scenes we hoped never to see again in Europe. Many innocent Ukrainian civilians have been killed. Millions have been displaced and received as refugees by neighboring countries. Much of the rest of the world has been swift to impose sanctions and offer humanitarian aid. Yet questions on the role of international law remain. What use? is international law and the institutions created to enforce it 
if the aggressor chooses not to abide by it. Therefore, today's discussion on the past and the future of war crimes jurisprudence is crucial. As representative of the world's legal capital, I have faith in the ability of our legal institutions to back up words with actions, to achieve justice for the victims of the Ukraine crisis, however long that may take. Some of the first steps taken by the Hague's legal community give me hope. Ukraine itself chose to approach the International Court of Justice, the highest court of the United Nations, to ask for the invasion to be stopped. The court has since ruled it has not seen any evidence supporting this justification of the war. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has decided to open an investigation into the situation. He already has a team of people on the ground to collect evidence of war crimes. Many of our knowledge institutes and NGOs have also been active, organizing discussions to explain the legal implications of the invasion to the general public. And in that light, I'm also grateful to the Brookings Institute for cooperating with the Netherlands Embassy in Washington and the City of The Hague in organizing today's event. I wish you an inspiring session and in the words of the former chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials, the great Benjamin Ferenc, law, not war. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for this invitation. I think it originated with you, Constanza, and it's incredibly nice to be here at the Brookings Institute, uh, and I thank all of the institutions uh, who have made uh, this possible. When we first conceived of this lecture, of course, events were not as they are now, and so there's been a bit of a moving adjustment uh, as we move along, and the essence of what I'm going to talk about is to connect the moment that was 1945 with the situation that we are in today. And uh, I will much look forward to the conversation with my colleagues and friends uh, that will follow uh, and questions, I hope, also from the audience. So to contextualize what I'm going to say, I want to go back to the autumn of 2010 when I received an invitation to give a lecture at the Faculty of Law in the city of Lviv, uh, a city I had not heard of in 2010 until it was pointed out to me that Lviv is Lemberg, is Lvov. Would I come to the law faculty and give a lecture on my work and cases on crimes against humanity and genocide? two international crimes that came into existence as legal concepts in the summer of 1945. I spent a part of that summer writing the lecture, and in the course of the research, I discovered, really accidentally, I was not looking for it, that the man who put the concept of crimes against humanity into international law, the renowned Professor Hirsch Lauterpacht, happened to come from Lviv, indeed, he had been a student at the university that invited me, although those who issued the invitation were blissfully unaware of that fact. Later, he went to the University of Vienna, and he studied under Hans Kelsen. And then I learned, again accidentally, that the man who invented the word genocide, and just to pause for a moment, walking down the street, I noticed uh, going past the Carnegie uh, building, it was the Carnegie Foundation that... Uh, commissioned the book in which the word genocide first appeared when it was published in 1944. So there is a very direct connection with place in relation uh, to these concepts. He too, Raphael Lemkin, had been a student at the same law faculty in Lvov as it then was, although not at the same time as Hirsch Lauterpacht, but five years later. Those who had invited me to Lviv also didn't know about that point of connection, and they were surprised and delighted. And then I learned that at the Nuremberg trial, the famous trial of 45 and 46, Lauterpacht and Lemkin were actually part of the prosecution teams on behalf of the British 
and the Americans, and they targeted, in particular, Hans Frank, who had been Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer, then Minister of Justice in Bavaria, then Governor General of Nazi-occupied Poland. He was prosecuted for both crimes against humanity and genocide. When the trial opened on November the 20th, 1945, Lauter Pact and Lemkin did not know that the man they were prosecuting was actually the person in the dock most responsible for the deaths of their own entire families. This is a set of facts that you literally could not invent, as the historian Anthony Beaver wrote rather generously. And I think it was probably my work as a barrister rather than my academic writings that had caused the invitation to be sent from Lviv. In the summer of 1998, I'd been involved peripherally in the negotiations in Rome that led to the creation of the International Criminal Court, a body that would have jurisdiction over both genocide and crimes against humanity, uh, as well as war crimes and the crime of aggression. My role was limited, in effect, to drafting the preamble with my dear friend Andrew Clapham, uh, and this was really a case of two very young international lawyers being told to prepare a draft, working on the assumption that everything they put in it would somehow be changed, but it emerged completely untouched. Hence, the line in the preamble about the duty of every state to investigate international crimes remained and was then picked up a few months later in the famous Pinochet proceedings uh, in the English courts. This is the way uh, of international law. The essential difference between genocide and crimes against humanity, concepts which are on the front pages of our newspapers as we gather here today, really uh, centres on the question of who is protected and why. If 10,000 people are killed, murdered, exterminated, or even a few hundred, that act will invariably be a crime against humanity. But will it be a genocide? That depends, of course, on the intentions of the killers and the ability of prosecutors to prove that intention to the satisfaction of judges. To establish the crime of genocide, you have to prove that the act of killing is motivated by a special intent, the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. If a criminal prosecutor can't prove that a large number of people have been killed with that intent, then the crime of genocide is not established under international law. And so basically, you've had these two crimes operating side by side for the last 75 years and overlapping. Every genocide is also going to be a crime against humanity, but not every crime against humanity will be a genocide. The bottom line of this momentous development in 1945 is that for the first time, the protection of individuals and groups was integrated into the international legal order. Sovereignty was not absolute. The rights of the state over people subject to its jurisdiction or power was limited, and that was a new idea, and it was a revolutionary idea. Lauter Pact and Lemkin were individuals who generated ideas, and those ideas fed into the Nuremberg process, and they fed in to our modern international legal order. How did it actually all begin and then move along? I take as my starting point often the Atlantic Charter of 1941, the moment when uh, Roosevelt and Churchill met off the coast of Newfoundland and agreed a set of principles which would govern the creation of a new world order after the war against Nazi Germany uh, was over. And the central elements of that new world order was cast really on three fundamental pillars. The prohibition on the use of force in international relations, the creation of rules on economic liberalization, trade included, and rights for individuals and peoples. You find in the Atlantic Charter the seeds of the concept of self-determination. That was then taken forward four years later in San Francisco with the negotiation and adoption of the United Nations Charter, which for the first time in a multilateral instrument of any kind spoke of human rights and fundamental freedoms 
for individuals and for human beings, and also of the commitment to decolonization. Also around that time, a few weeks later, in London, negotiations began for the statute that would found the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. And into the statute were incorporated four basic, three basic crimes. Crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, as they were called then, the crime of aggression today, and war crimes. Of those, war crimes was the only one which had been established and with roots in modern international law. There was a fourth crime that didn't make it into the statute, but did then make it into the indictment a few months later, and that was Lemkin's notion of genocide. The simple point is that this was the moment when these concepts came into being. The things that we are talking about today, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide and the crime of aggression, find their origin and roots in that remarkable moment in 1945. And the United States played an absolutely central role in that moment. I I, I think it could not have happened but for the United States. And there were many individuals who were involved in giving rise to that moment. I'm thinking in particular of individuals like Robert Jackson, who was the chief prosecutor, And then one character who's fallen out of the story, but I think played a very important role in the elaboration of the key principles in the United Nations Charter, and that's Ralph Bunch. When Robert Jackson made the opening speech on the 20th of November 1945, he said, as we famously know, never again. And those words, sadly, uh, have come not to ring so true. But when he spoke on that opening day, and I've just had a class uh, with my students up at Harvard going over the video, uh, which is available for anyone to see, it is an enormously powerful speech. It encapsulates the totality of the order with which we are now um, engaged and asking ourselves the question, what does Ukraine mean for that order Is it the destruction of the order, or is it a moment when it can actually be reinforced? And a central aspect for me, and what I'm going to talk about today in a little more detail now, is the place of the United States, having essentially created that order in 1945 and assisted in its elaboration over time, what is actually the position of the United States today in taking that order forward? It was a revolutionary moment, and it was followed by a myriad of other developments. I don't have time to get into all of the history of what happened in the intervening 75 years, but just a number of points on which to perch. 1946, the United Nations General Assembly meets for the first time, and effectively by its first resolutions, 95 and 96, incorporates into international law the Nuremberg Principles, and these four crimes effectively become part of the international legal order. In 1948, we have the first multilateral human rights treaty, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, in which the United States played a very key role, but of course did not ratify for some 40 years until President Reagan accidentally visited a cemetery in Bitburg in Germany uh, and unwittingly um, paid homage to a grave site that included a number of SS officers. Mm -hmm. International law often develops in these accidental uh, sorts of ways. But the absence of ratification by the United States was, of course, significant and reflected also the reason why Robert Jackson never used the word genocide at any point in the Nuremberg trial and why the United States opposed the development of genocide. It was concerned, and in particular, southern senators were concerned, that the concept would be used in relation to historical matters in the United States, some actually not so historical. For 50 years, 
developments in relation to these rights for individuals and groups trundled along very quietly. And it really wasn't until the 1990s that uh, things uh, moved forward in a significant way. You've already made mention, uh, Constanza, of the developments in relation to Rwanda. Rwanda and Yugoslavia caused the creation of the first new international criminal tribunals since Nuremberg and Tokyo. And the Clinton administration played an absolutely crucial role in that moment. And Madeleine Albright, whom we honour and respect on this day, played an absolutely key role in that moment. Both tribunals had jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. And I was discussing uh, in our preparatory meeting, uh, it's only now that I've really begun to focus on it, the absence of aggression being placed not in the Rwanda tribunal's jurisdiction, but certainly in the Yugoslav tribunal's jurisdiction. There's probably a very good reason for that. But effectively, it meant that the use of force as such by Serbia against other newly independent entities that emerged with the collapse of the former Yugoslavia didn't get addressed by international judges and aggression moved into a sort of place of vacuum. The developments in relation to Yugoslavia and Rwanda in themselves catalyzed new movement in relation to the creation of the International Criminal Court, which had been, uh, I kid you not, in negotiation for 50 years until in 1998 states gathered uh, in Rome and adopted the statute. And 1998 was a really fundamental year because that was the year not only that the ICC statute uh, was adopted, but also the year in which um, Mr Pinochet was arrested in London, ironically enough charged with crimes against humanity and genocide in a Franco-era Spanish law, and it was also the year in which for the first time a serving head of state was indicted for international crimes. This had never happened before, and that was Slobodan Milosevic. So uh, there was a move, a strong sense of direction at this point, and things were taking, I would say, um, a significant direction, and then, of course, the events of September the 11th happened. And that created, I mean, a bit of an understatement, a jolt, shall we say, in our commitment to the idea that all human beings and all groups at all time and place have minimum rights and minimum standards. And that moment caused the United States, but not the United States alone, the United Kingdom, I think, is in a similar position, and there are some other countries, to take steps that I think were fundamentally problematic for the order and the structure that had been invented and taken forward in 1945. A war was promulgated against Iraq, which was, in my view, manifestly illegal. It is known, for example, that the deputy legal advisor at the Foreign Office, Elizabeth Wilmshurst, resigned because she considered it was not only illegal, but a crime of aggression, and she did not feel able to serve a government that was prosecuting such a war. The United States engaged in techniques of interrogation that, in my view and the view of many other people, plainly crossed the line into torture, and there has never been an accounting of any sort for acts that, I think, cross the threshold into a crime against humanity, so extensive are they? And of course, the United States at this point began to engage with the International Criminal Court and adopted a position, again, I express only my own view, that I think was hopeless, namely that the court could never exercise jurisdiction over any individual who was a national of a country that was not a party to the statute of the International Criminal Court. I've always thought the argument is preposterous. If an American comes to Britain and perpetrates the crime of genocide in the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom fails to do anything about it, of course the ICC has got jurisdiction. It matters not a whit what the nationality of that person is by reference to the statute 
of the International Criminal Court. The simple point that I'm making is that the relationship with some of the fundamentals that had been put in place in 1945 became more semi-detached. Uh, it was not a single moment. There was a continuum that led to this, but it was a moment that was articulated, I think, with some degree of precision. So with that by way of background, let me just say a little bit more about aspects of United States engagement with each of these crimes in relation to subsequent developments. Genocide. Genocide, regrettably in my view, has come to be seen as the crime of crimes. It isn't. I don't think that a crime against humanity is any less terrible than an act uh, of genocide. But in popular parlance and in popular consciousness, if something isn't characterised as a genocide, it will get a lot less attention. That, no doubt, is one of the reasons why President Zelensky has taken in this past week to referring to the terrible events in Bucha and other parts of Ukraine as a genocide. I think, to be fair to him, he is probably using it more in a political sense and in the sense of public consciousness than in a strict uh, legal sense. But the moment he mentioned the word genocide, attention went up several more notches from already a high starting point. And genocide is very much in the news uh, these days. There is the case of the Rohingya in Myanmar, and to be clear, I'm one of the council, others are here today, uh, for the Gambia in relation to those proceedings. There is the case of the Uyghurs in China, and uh, something of a rush, really, I think, to characterise what is happening to the Uyghurs, which, in my view, appears to be terrible, whatever label you put on it, as a genocide. And the reason for that, I think, is clear. The moment a president calls it a genocide, it makes it onto page one of the newspaper. If it's just a crime against humanity or just a violation of fundamental human rights, it may not be reported at all. Or if it is reported, it'll only be reported in the middle pages of some newspapers. The United States has always had an ambivalence with the concept of genocide, as I've explained already by reference to the Nuremberg trials and what came subsequently. But more recently, there has been a willingness to characterize certain things as a genocide. President George W. Bush in relation to Sudan and more recently uh, by the Trump and Biden administrations in relation to the Rohingya and the treatment of the Uyghurs. And then, not so long ago, President Biden stepped out and for the first time for any president in the United States, characterized what had happened to the Armenians in 1915 as a genocide. And that got, as you know, a huge amount of attention. I was invited to give, uh, to participate in um, Fareed Zakaria's television program to uh, discuss the momentousness of this moment um, and, uh, to be honest, got myself into a bit of trouble with aspects of the Armenian community uh, because I wasn't quite as gleeful as I think some hoped uh, that I would be. Why wasn't I so gleeful? I wasn't so gleeful for a number of reasons. I won't go through all of them. But, but first off, there is an issue about putting the label of genocide under the convention on events that occurred 30 or more years before the word was actually invented. And if we're going to do that, we've got to work out the principles that we're going to apply temporally and otherwise in applying that label. If we go back to 1915, why not go back to the 19th century? Why not go back to the 18th century or the 17th century. In fact, why not go back 2,000 years and start um, uh, taking these kinds of steps? There's been a very significant development that has occurred simultaneously with President Biden's actions, and that is the characterization, and this is, I think, an even more significant development, of Germany, of its treatment of the Herero 
in what is today Namibia and what used to be Southwest Africa as a genocide and making available a billion euros, not in compensation, but in development assistance to offset the wrong that was done. This has huge consequences because this is actually the first time that a country which itself was responsible for the act of wrongdoing has put that label on that act. And that really does open the door in relation to the retroactive application. I mention this because in the Farid Zachariah television program, I made the point, and I was asked, why am I not more excited about President Biden's statement? And I said, well, I'd be much more excited if President Biden characterized actions that are taking place in the United States uh, as a genocide. Um, the treatment of Native Americans, the indigenous communities, for example. Why not that? Or uh, the treatment of black people in southern states in the 19th and earlier parts of the 20th century. If we're going to open that door, let's open it in a way in which international law isn't just for others. Let's talk about enslavement. And let's ask ourselves what labels we want to put on that if we're going to open the door and go backwards. So I, I suppose what I'm saying here is that the move to label things as genocide might be a good thing, although some of you know I have certain um, hesitations about the concept of genocide. But if we're going to do it, let's do it systematically and let's do it in accordance with particular principles. And let's not just do it as part of international law being for others. International law is for us also. Just to be clear, this is not a Brit-American bashing because exactly the same principles can be applied to the United Kingdom in relation to colonialism and enslavement. And I will come on to that. It's just that I'm in Washington, D.C., and I want to give some local examples. So there is a semi-detached relationship, I think, in Washington and in the United States with the concept of genocide. A little too easy to point to the genocides of others, a little too slow in reflecting on its own history. Crimes against humanity, and I speak here with some hesitation as we have the uh, individual who was responsible really for uh, heralding through a convention which really should have been adopted 70 years ago. I mean, it is nothing short of scandalous that in 2022 we do not have a binding convention on the prevention and punishment uh, of uh, crimes against humanity to lie alongside the Convention on Genocide, and maybe a lot of the problems that have arisen would have faded away um, if we hadn't uh, put that subject into abeyance for so long. Perhaps genocide wouldn't have reached quite the elevated status that it has in public consciousness if there was another way of labelling or dealing with certain acts that amount to crimes. But we now do have a convention in draft form uh, proposed by the International Law Commission. Uh, its special rapporteur is present today, and I'm hoping, Sean, in the conversation later we can talk about it. I am a firm supporter uh, of that convention. I think it's nothing short of scandalous that the UN General Assembly has not moved that uh, convention forward, and I hope uh, that countries will now move that forward. And I hope that events in Ukraine today, which could cut in a number of different ways, contribute to a stronger effort to push forward that draft convention. But let me talk about American and British semi-detachment with the concept of crimes against humanity. Again, to disclose, I am counsel in the case. I am not independent as an observer, and I try to talk about it as fairly as I can. But I want to say a few words about a place called Chagos, which most of you have probably never heard of. There are a few of you here who will have heard of it. It is an archipelago of about 60 countries. It was a British colony between 1814 and 1968. In the early 1960s, the United States decided that it would like to develop a uh, strategic military uh, plan to place uh, military airstrips and other such things on strategic uh, island atolls located in various places around the world. And it chose an island that you will have heard of called Diego Garcia as one of these fabulous places. 
and it cut a secret deal with the British to allow the United States to establish a military base, initially a communications facility, uh, on the island of Diego Garcia. And an agreement was entered into. Britain, at this point, faced a bit of a problem because it had committed in the United Nations Charter to the principle of decolonization. And the people living in the British colony of Mauritius, of which the Chagos Archipelago had been a part for uh, 150 years, wanted their independence. And what the British did, and I'm paraphrasing a longer and slightly more complex story, was uh, to detach the Chagos Archipelago from Mauritius by ordering council in 1965, make available to the United States the island of Diego Garcia for the military base and remove the entire population from all of the islands, Diego Garcia and every other island by means of a forcible deportation which happened between 1968 and 1973. The entire population, about 2,000 people, going back more than a century and a half in terms of their uh, ancestors, were forcibly removed, in my view, in manifest violation of international law and all of the rules that had already developed by the mid-1960s against forcible deportation, prompted, ironically enough, by Nazi practices of forcible deportation, which led to changes in international rules after 1945 population was scattered hither and thither, Mauritius, Seychelles, Crawley, next to Gatwick Airport in London, and the population there lingered. Mauritius eventually decided to take proceedings. A number of people in this room have been involved uh, in those proceedings, and the upshot was that the International Court of Justice, by an advisory opinion, not in a contentious case, gave an authoritative ruling in 2019 that the United Kingdom actions in creating a new colony in 1965, the British Indian Ocean Territory, and consequently removing the entire population to another place was illegal, and it was illegal ab initio. The matter was sent to the General Assembly of the United Nations, which adopted a resolution in May 2019 by an overwhelming majority. Uh, only four states in the world voted with the United Kingdom and the United States against a resolution for the implementation of the ICJ advisory opinion, which provided for the right of return of all the Chagossians and the departure of the United Kingdom from Chagas by uh, November 2019. The four countries that supported the United Kingdom and the United States were Australia, the Maldives, Hungary, and Israel. Apart from that, no other country supported the two countries. Subsequent development, and I should just say by way of context, the position of Mauritius has been that the island base of Diego Garcia will remain in American hands. It is not an issue. And a long-term agreement has been offered by Mauritius to the United States or to the United States and the United Kingdom. In January 2021, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea determined that the ICJ advisory opinion had determinative effects and that Mauritius was the coastal state. So we now have two international rulings, a, an overwhelmingly supported resolution of the General Assembly. And you would have thought that perhaps the United Kingdom and the United States might say, OK, time's up, time to go. No. Nope. It's two fingers up in the air at both international rulings, just like China sends two fingers up in the air to international rulings that it doesn't like, just like Russia sends two fingers in the air to international rulings that it doesn't like. How does this relate to crimes against humanity? So Article 9 of the ICC statute sorry, Article 7 of the ICC statute, provides as follows. For the purposes of this statute, crimes against humanity means any of the following acts when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack 
directed against any civilian population with knowledge. And it includes, and I quote, deportation or the forcible transfer of population. Now that provision, of course, didn't apply to events that occurred in, 19, in the period between 1968 and 1973 when the population was forcibly removed. Although there is a question as to whether there is a continuing violation which takes you across the line and post-1998. But what is certainly the case is that the refusal of the United States or the United Kingdom, principally the United Kingdom, but its principal supporter is the United States, to now allow the Chagossians to return is, in my view and in the view of many people, a crime against humanity. And it is one which is currently being explored in various fora and by various non-governmental organisations. I'm not making the argument that there is a direct equivalence between that violation, between that crime against humanity and a crime against humanity which may be taking place on a much larger and more grotesque scale today in Ukraine. The simple point that I'm making is you can't really afford to be selective about the crimes against humanity you're going to object to when you yourself have in different but nevertheless significant circumstances failed to heed the rights of an entire community. It is ironic to hear the United Kingdom complain about Russia's occupation of parts of Ukraine when the United Kingdom itself is occupying a part of Africa and Mauritius. It's ironic to hear the United States and the United Kingdom complain that China is not respecting the arbitral award in relation to the South China Seas when the United Kingdom, with the support of the United States, is not heeding two international rulings that make it crystal clear that Mauritius alone has sovereignty over the territory of the Chagos archipelago. So this aspect of double standard has an impact. But if you want to see elements of that impact, I suggest, for example, you look at the vote in the General Assembly that took place a few weeks ago in relation to Russia's engagements in Ukraine. Yes, it was a large vote, but if you break it down, it gets to be quite interesting. Look at how Africa voted. Half the countries of Africa abstained. And in part, that abstention will be informed by a range of different factors, but one of them is the application of double standards in relation to the settlement of 1945, the rules that emerged, and so on and so forth. Turn to the crime of aggression. I've already said that it sort of fell into a sort of desuetude after 1945, 1946, uh, Nuremberg and Tokyo, but it has been uh, revived. Ironically, the crimes against peace idea, which is today called the crime of aggression, made its way into the Nuremberg Statute at the instance of a Soviet jurist, Aaron Trainen, who had to persuade the British, the French, and the Americans to include the crime of aggression in the Nuremberg uh, Statute. Uh, and he did so, uh, and subsequently it became the largest part of the Nuremberg trial. The judges in the judgment called it the supreme crime. But for the illegal waging of war in September the 1st, 1939, none of the other crimes would have fallen within the jurisdiction of the Nuremberg Tribunal, and none of the other crimes, in a certain sense, would have occurred. And we've got exactly the same situation uh, today. I noted this point a few weeks ago, just three days after the uh, war in Ukraine began in an opinion piece that I wrote in the Financial Times, which I wrote in some haste, 600 words they allowed me, on any aspect of Ukraine and international law. And the subject that I focused on was the crime of aggression. Why? Because I was pretty comfortable that the three other crimes, war crimes and crimes against humanity, and to the extent it comes into play, genocide would indeed be addressed, either by national prosecutors in Ukraine or, as we're now seeing in Germany, in Poland, in Lithuania, 
and also by the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court because Ukraine had declared its acceptance of the uh, jurisdiction of the court in 2014 in relation to those three crimes, but not the crime of aggression. And the crime of aggression mattered to me because it is the only crime which necessarily leads to the top table. It's the only leadership crime in which inevitably the focus has to be on Mr. Putin and certain people around Mr. Putin. The op-ed had unexpected consequences. I found myself being contacted by the foreign minister of Ukraine. I found myself being contacted by former prime ministers of the United Kingdom. And a sort of momentum began to cut to the chase and without getting into too much detail. There is now a very active but still informal discussion taking place led by Ukraine and five other European countries to elaborate an international agreement which would allow for the establishment of a special criminal tribunal delegating the laws of Ukraine to an international institution, a court, which would then allow investigations and, if necessary, prosecutions for the crime of aggression to be conducted in relation to the leadership in Russia. Ironically, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine all have the crime of aggression in their domestic laws because they invented it. They then put it into their national penal codes where they have lingered happily for the last 75 years, which gives you a very good basis for a delegated uh, power. I don't know what direction this matter will take, but in relation to the points that I'm making, which is sort of the emergent, semi-detached and self-interested approach to the 1945 moment, the point I'd make is this. In, in, In relation to informal soundings with the governments, people associated with the governments of France, Britain and the United States, what emerges is there isn't a view that this mustn't happen, There isn't a view that it couldn't happen. There isn't a view that it's not legally possible for it to happen. But there is a concern which is based on something else. Oh, my word, if we can create an international criminal tribunal for Russia today, why can't they create one for us tomorrow? And that is the factor that is giving, I suspect, those three governments, and maybe some other governments, pause for thought. And that pause... I worry, if it's given legs and develops over time, will lead to the very unfortunate situation that in three or four years we're going to have trials in The Hague for mid-level military types who engaged in horrors at Mariupol or Butcher or other places, but the top table will get off the hook. And that, I think, would be an absolutely deplorable situation in the particular circumstances of this case. It has to be said, and I know the debate much better in Britain than in the United States, but I assume it's a sort of parallel debate, that this is an instance where the shadow of Iraq looms very large. And the experience in Britain in relation to that conflict and the consequences of that conflict is no doubt one of the significant factors that is concentrating minds about what doors would be opened if you went with the crime of aggression in this manner in relation to Russia uh, today. So all of this, to come to a close, is a way of saying uh, I am a, a true supporter of the role played by the United States, by Britain, by France, by the Soviet Union in creating that 1945 moment putting the idea of rights for individuals and groups through these new and existing international crimes into legal instruments. But I'm acutely aware from my own country and from this country that there has been a double standard. There has been a selectivity in terms of how the 1945 moment's rules have been identified and have been applied. I listened to President Biden characterize Mr. Putin as a war criminal. And I have to say that made me rather uncomfortable. Perhaps it's the sort of purest lawyer in me. The way I would have put it is, yes, war crimes appear to be being committed and perhaps crimes against humanity also. 
But at this point, we don't know the exact circumstances of what has happened. It may be, indeed, that the evidence leads all the way to the top table. But we can't be sure about that, and prosecutors will tell you it is very difficult to prove command responsibility on some of these crimes in the absence of decent evidence. So I would have preferred President Biden perhaps to be a little more restrained. But there's another aspect of it. I actually don't think the worst thing Mr. Putin may have done is to have overseen the commission of war crimes being perpetrated on the territory of Ukraine, if that is what they are. The problem is the war. The problem is the decision to invade Ukraine. And we have rules about that. I think that is the place to put the accent. And I worry that the growing emphasis on war crimes is a way of deflecting attention to the real issues that are at stake here. It may be, of course, that things are changing. I, I mentioned earlier the position of the United States in relation to nationals of countries that are not uh, parties to the statute of the International Criminal Court. So I was probably not the only person in this room who was somewhat astonished, understatement, when Senator Lindsey Graham proposed a resolution warmly endorsing and supporting the International Criminal Court's investigation of Russian nationals for crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine. But hang on a second, isn't this the same guy who didn't want the ICC investigating American crimes in relation to Afghanistan or British crimes in relation to uh, Iraq? Yes, it is. That resolution was not only adopted, but it was adopted unanimously in the Senate of the United States. Uh, what's going on here? Has there been a sudden about turn on the engagement with the ICC and with all these rules of international law? One suspects probably not. One suspects that probably it's more uh, in relation to the moment. But that moment has consequences, and the consequence, of course, is that it really becomes pretty difficult for a U.S. administration going forward to argue that the ICC can't exercise jurisdiction over other <laughs> nationals of states that are not parties to the statute of the ICC. Again, we have the spectre of selectivity, of double standard, of hypocrisy. And these things do matter in the court of public opinion out there, beyond London, beyond Washington, beyond Paris. There are other countries in the world that matter. Some of them are allies, some of them are not. But they have views and they follow these things extremely attentively. To close, let me just mention a possible fifth crime, which I've been very involved in because I co-chaired an international working group to explore the possible introduction into the statute of the International Criminal Court uh, of a first crime which wouldn't focus on the protection of the human, but on the protection of the environment. I think if we step back and look at the threats that are coming towards us, um, Ukraine today is pretty terrible. But I think climate change and other environmental threats are likely to be, over time, even worse. And one of the questions that I think we need to start thinking about is moving the regime of international criminal law away from a purely anthropocentric approach. And I think what you're going to see in the coming period, as more and more governments attach support to the idea of a new crime at an international level, to be integrated into the statute of the International Criminal Court, the crime of harm on a widespread and significant scale to the environment, ecocide, as some people are calling it, a question will arise about the United States' engagement with that crime. And what's interesting, at the grassroots level, young people, there is overwhelming support for consideration of these kinds of ideas. And I think that will trickle down and create a significant impulse to open our minds to that possibility. I mention that really in a positive spirit. I think what the United States did in 1945 was remarkable. And I really want the United States back batting for the protection of that moment 
and for the taking forward of it going forward. It's very hard to see without the United States active engagement in those rules that it can completely withstand the kinds of attacks it is now under. Perhaps this is a moment that Mr. Putin has unleashed unwittingly, a moment to actually recognise that something extraordinarily important happened in 1945. Many people in this city played a huge role in making that happen at that moment. But ultimately, I think on all of this, I'm going to end on a positive note. Um, I was talking to one of my colleagues at Harvard last week over breakfast uh, who said to me, doesn't this just feel so terrible and so glum? What are we doing? Why are we bothering with this international law? And I told her the story of a moment when I was a young academic in the mid-1980s, a research fellow in Cambridge. And I had a colleague at St. Catherine's College who was the, the professor of English legal history at Cambridge University, Sir John Baker, a wonderful human being. Um, and, and he would occasionally, once a month, invite me in for lunch for a natter about what I was working on on international law. And I'd tell him what I was working on with Ellie Lauterpacht or Derek Bowett or whoever it was. And he'd pause and he'd say, ah, yes. We had a similar problem in English law in 1472, and it took 270 years to sort it out. And, and I think that's the positive way of looking about international law. We mustn't forget that 1945 was very, very recent. You can't expect those kinds of changes to take place and everyone's suddenly going to keel over and say, oh, yeah, no more genocide, no more murder, no more this, that, and that. That's not how life is. These things take a long time to bed in. And so it's on that optimistic note, two steps forward, one step sideways, one step back, another step forward. Maybe this will end up being one of those step forward moments rather than a step back moment. Thank you very much. Okay, can you all hear me? All right, wonderful. Well, thank you, Philippe, for that master class. Um, and the historical sweep is really remarkable. Um, so much for us to chew on and uh, where to go from here. And I do want to make sure we have room for our other panelists to join us up here. But let me just ask you a couple of questions um, keying off of what you just had to say. Y you really honed in on the question of selectivity. Um, and double standards. Um, and I think we could spend a long time um, going down that, that rabbit hole. But it does leave me scratching my head. Um, is the logical conclusion of that argument that therefore the United States should not invoke these principles until it cleans up its own act? Same with UK. Um, and if it's not the United States or a few other countries willing to take the leadership role, who will? Certainly it's not in China's interest or Russia's interest or many other countries um, to, to, to take a lead on this. Um, so that leaves us with, you know, what is all this for, as you pointed out in these uh, discussions? Why do we have these laws in the first place um, if we're not going to use them? And now we bring it to Ukraine, where it's such a flagrant violation of the UN Charter and the many other crimes that you discussed, if this is not a 1945 moment, what could be? Uh, now, that was after a world war with you know, millions of people uh, uh, wounded and killed. Um, so maybe we're not at the same scale as 1945. So can, can you reflect just a little bit more on what you ended up with? You know, We created these laws, governments created these laws, um, Now's the time to use them. There's a war of words about war criminals and genocide. Um, but, you know, why not use what we've got to move that ball a little bit forward, one step sure. forward? I, I, you've heard I'm, uh, you know, actively engaged on this um, dreadful Ukrainian situation. And I'm fully supportive of the efforts that are taking place, the investigations at the national level, the investigations by the ICC prosecutor, 
efforts of various governments to use the rules that were created in 1945. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not starry-eyed about international law. Is there a government in the world that is not selective or hypocritical or double standards in terms of its approach to international law? If there is one, I haven't yet met it. So it, it's not a critique that is addressed only to the United States. It's a critique that is addressed generally. But I think certain countries in the order that was created in 1945, have a particular role. The US is one of them. I think Britain, to a different extent today, because it is so diminished, is another one. And if the countries that effectively created um, those orders are going to turn a blind eye when the order doesn't suit them, I think we have a real problem. I remember in 2003 attending the meeting of the American Society of International Law, which is meeting right now, and being on a panel with my dear late friend James Crawford, um, where his opening remarks on a panel about Iraq um, were um, made in his traditional Australian style, but perhaps didn't go down quite as well as they might in Melbourne or Sydney. Uh, It didn't go down quite as well in Washington as they might in Melbourne uh, or Sydney. And he asked the question, what is this society? Is it the American Society of International Law for Others. And (laughs) that um, issue, I think, in the context of Iraq, was pertinent. I I myself have come under attack in recent days from some academics, from some students, from some people, for proposing the creation of a special criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression in relation to Ukraine, but having failed to do so in relation to Iraq. Now, look, my position on Iraq has been very clear, and it is true that although I thought the war was illegal, I didn't write an op-ed piece saying that Tony Blair should be subject to investigation and prosecution for the crime of aggression, although other people did. And, And that has caused me to ask long and hard. Actually, why didn't I do that? Perhaps I was in a different stage of my life, perhaps living in the country where these things happen um, imposes a restraint on what you do. I don't know. But I think the point is a decent one. And I think it goes to the heart of your question. For many people around the world, Ukraine is no worse than Iraq. Okay? You travel around the world and you speak to people about their views about what happened in Iran, and they will say to you that is as bad or worse in terms of the numbers of people killed. And therefore, you know, does that mean you don't write the article calling for a tribunal of crime of aggression? No. It means no, you now it have learned, oh, I should have, and now I'm doing it. Right. And so isn't that why we've created international tribunals in the first place? Because we know that member states are highly political and defective and have their own interests and will not resolve these matters in their own accord. That's why we've created these international tribunals. But what is to be done if the international tribunals apply the law in a manner that is perceived to be selective? So, you know, let's just throw out an aspect of this. The deputy mayor referred to a um, recent decision of the International Court of Justice, the Provisional Measures Order, uh, adopted at the request of Ukraine essentially in a case that is intended to uh, obtain, in due course, a judgment from the International Court of Justice that no genocide is taking place against ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine. It's a creative bit of lawyering. Um, Reasonable people had different views about the merits or the prospects of success. I was consulted informally about it, and I thought, no, I thought it's worth going. I thought it's worth raising it. It gives you a forum. You may disappear as a functioning state, and you will therefore have a place where you can raise these kinds of arguments. I have to say, though, I was very surprised with what the court did. I was very surprised with how far the court went in terms of dealing with issues in relation to uh, the use of force. And that raises for me the question of whether the court would have done the same thing in relation to a parallel case brought 20 years ago. Now, I think it's reasonable to say 2022 isn't 2003. 
But I find it hard to imagine that that could have happened back then. And it is true. I mean, that Russia has crossed many lines. What has happened is utterly appalling. But it is also true that it is touching people like me and you in ways that seem in part extraordinary. I mean, I'm living in Cambridge, Massachusetts right now. And walking down streets in Cambridge, Massachusetts and seeing so many flags of Ukraine hanging out, you sort of ask yourself, what is actually going on here? This sudden embrace of Ukraine, this sudden love of uh, Ukraine, this sudden embrace of the rules of international law. You're right. You put it in a bigger political context. It's not a reason for not doing something. But I think one of our functions is to constantly step back and ask ourselves the questions. How are these things being perceived by people in other places? And I can tell you from my students, from governments that I'm working with, it is perceived as yet another example of double standard. All of a sudden, because it's in Europe, Europeans really care about this. And because Europeans really care about it, Americans really care about it. And I think all I'm saying is... Yeah. Let's recognize that. Right. We recognize it. I don't think we can be purist about it. And there is the real world out there of international diplomacy and politics that really does make a difference. So when you look at what the UN General Assembly has done, um, even just yesterday in voting Russia off of the UN Human Rights Council, that vote margin went way down from what it had been a few weeks earlier on condemning the attack on, on Ukraine. That's an indication, I think, of the point you're making, that there's some wobbliness um, among certain states about selectively attacking uh, Russia in this situation until we know more. But then they revert back to legal principles and say, wait, we need a proper investigation of what happened on the ground there, right? So there is an interest and a desire for some kind of independent, impartial investigation of what's going on before we start labeling it in for all of our politicized um, reasons. I wanted to... Um, you know, towards the end, you were introducing the concept of ecocide. I know there are a lot of people um, online who are listening to us that are interested in this, and we got some questions um, beforehand. Um, but maybe we could t- connect the two and say, let's imagine a scenario in which um, the Russians in Ukraine were also committing terrible environmental crimes, um, massive deforestation or something having to do with the nuclear power plants. How would that fit into your concept of what an uh, ecocide means? Well, I've thought about that a lot, even in relation to this context, because, as you know, there have been attacks on nuclear power plants. I, I mean, it seems extraordinary, but nuclear power plants have apparently been targeted, which seems the height of folly. We know that for some weeks the Chernobyl power plant was occupied. I mean, to my mind, launching a military attack in the vicinity of or on a nuclear power plant is plainly something that crosses the threshold into risking significant harm to the environment and falls within the category of ecocide issues. Yes, I I regret that I haven't said more this morning about ecocide. This is part of the Mm. skew towards um, Ukraine. Originally, when we conceived of this, I was going to say a lot more about it. But let me say one thing about that. So we sat on a working group and we wanted a unanimous consensus document because... We all know that a consensus document has greater legs. But one of the points of difference between the 12 members of the group was whether to list in our proposal acts which we considered to constitute ecocide. And I think in this respect, I was very much influenced by the experience of the genocide effort of Mr. Mr. Lemkin and the convention and the problem of listings. In the Genocide Convention, certain categories of groups are identified. The targeting of them will be treated as potentially being a genocide. Nationality, race, ethnicity. But other categories of groups are left out. Groups who come together for political reasons. Sexual orientation. And the effect of producing a list, which includes certain things but not other things, is to say, well, okay, you can have a genocide of those Mm-hmm. in relation to those groups, but not in relation to those groups, so it's fine to mistreat them. It, it, it leaves that feeling. And my concern, and I was part of the group, which was a majority in the end, say we're not going to list particular acts because to list 
any particular act is to exclude certain other acts, which sends the signal that that might be okay. There was a second issue, and it was this. If you're going to have a list on a crime against the environment, I don't think in 2022 you can have a list that doesn't include climate change. But the moment you put climate change on a list of definitions of ecocide, the proposal is dead. Because countries, I've participated in those negotiations, that have negotiated for 30 years on climate change are not suddenly going to accept the criminalization at the international level of certain acts that contribute to climate change in an amendment to the statute of the ICC. It will be for judges and prosecutors in due course, I think, to elaborate a list. But if there were to be evidence of intentional attacks or reckless attacks on a nuclear facility in the context of this or other conflicts, to my mind, that could constitute the crime uh, of ecocide. I was just horrified, as many people were, by repeated reports, not just one nuclear facility, more than one nuclear facility, being subject to attack. Hmm. Well, why don't we bring our other um, guests onto the panel, um, Jane and Diane and Sean, please join us. And um, we will get into another round of questions uh, that I will try to lead here. Um, and I think, Jane, I might start with you, if you're ready. I th you're, it'll automatically turn on. You don't need to do anything oh, with the microphone. Press. There it goes. Wow. Okay. Um, Jane, you, you recently testified to the U.S. House of Representatives that you know, these flagrant violations of international law committed by Russia and Ukraine demand mutually reinforcing accountability. What does that concept mean, and how would you um, apply it in this case? Well, thank, thank you for that question, and thank you, Philippe, for your very um, interesting and provocative uh, lecture. Um, I think all of us are seeing with our own eyes um, the brutal crimes that are being committed against the citizens of Ukraine. And it's clear that some accountability for those crimes uh, is necessary. And there are many different mechanisms that can be mutually enforcing, reinforcing that seek that accountability. Um, they can focus on in, uh, individual criminal responsibility. They can also focus on state responsibility. And we actually are in a situation where there is developed law. There are actually institutions that have jurisdiction that can play a role. And let me just um, mention a few. Uh, and, and by the way, if you focus in a, in a mutually reinforcing way on different violations through different institutions, you can build a web of accountability which can hopefully uh, send a message and, and, and um, uh, reinforce the most fundamental norms of international humanitarian law. First of all, uh, individual criminal accountability. First, the ICC has jurisdiction over war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, and potentially, if the facts bear out, genocide uh, on the territory of Ukraine because Ukraine has accepted the court's jurisdiction. So this is not a situation where there's a gap, where there's no international tribunal available, as in Syria. This is a situation where there is an international court that has jurisdiction. It's being welcomed by Ukraine. Uh, it's engaged in investigations. It's being supported by many countries. Uh, and I also think this is an area where the U.S. needs to assist. It needs to forthrightly assist and could particularly be useful in providing intelligence that could potentially link crimes on the ground to specific responsible individuals. And I, I don't think it's uh, so hard to imagine that the linkage could go all the way up to the top, given the nature of the crimes we're seeing and given the nature of past atrocities committed um, by Russian forces in aggressions launched by Vladimir Putin. Um, second, there are national justice proceedings in Ukraine. Uh, the Ukrainians have these crimes of war crimes and crimes of aggression in their domestic um, code, and they are engaged in um, very... Um, uh, conscientious investigations with the support of Lithuania, Poland, um, many uh, EU countries, the United States is supporting these domestic investigations um, in, uh, that, will, that could be prosecuted in Ukraine. There are other European 
countries that have jurisdiction as well. And together, they could build a web of accountability that essentially says to those who commit these crimes that you may run, but you cannot hide. You can enjoy no safe haven abroad. So the combination of the ICC and um, domestic prosecutions, and also there's a, another supporting institution, the UN recently created, the Human Rights Council created a commission of inquiry, which I think can be helpful in coordinating the work of the many, many NGOs that are involved in investigating and documenting crimes and can work together with courts. So those are at least three um, mechanisms that on the criminal accountability side, I think, can work together. What about state responsibility? Uh, the the, um, the uh, video at the beginning from the deputy mayor of The Hague talked about the case that Ukraine brought in the International Court of Justice against Russia, um, basically arguing that its specious claims of genocide were a violation of the object and purpose of the Genocide Convention. They, they did not in any sense provide a justification for the uh, unlawful war in which um, Russia is engaged. That's a way of, of trying to build state responsibility. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights has issued provisional measures uh, calling on Russia to stop its um, attacks against civilians, to open up humanitarian corridors. And while Russia is no longer a member of the Council of Europe, it's at least an open question whether um, the European court could continue to look at cases, the facts of which preceded the date of um, uh, the, the departure of Russia from the Council of Europe. Finally, I think it's really important to look at human rights violations by Russia of the citizens of Russia, because Russian journalists, Russian um, protesters, I mean, horrific violations against Russia's own citizens. And if there's ever to be any possibility of creating space, encouraging space for political accountability um, on behalf of, uh, of, of the Russian people uh, uh, holding Putin accountable, there needs to be more attention to those human rights violations. And maybe with Russia's being expelled from the UN Human Rights Council, I mean, frankly, the idea of Russia being on that council, given what it's been doing, maybe now that it's expelled, there may be the possibility of creating a special rapporteur that focuses on Russia. There are other mechanisms to focus on Russia as well. And I, I just want to say that um, no country is perfect, just in response to some of the points that Philippe was making. And I'd like to supplement the 1945 moment with a 1948 moment, which is when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. And the U.S. played a big role in that. And the whole idea of the Universal Declaration affirming the inherent dignity of each human being and the fact that everyone enjoys certain fundamental rights, civil and political, economic and social, and that we all have a role to play in advancing those rights, you know, that was a very important moment as well. And it was understood as being the beginning uh, of, a, of a process of developing rights and developing more effective enforcement of those rights. And, you know, the U.S. as a democracy has had many different governments over the course of our history. Uh, I haven't agreed personally with what many of them have done, but I've uh, lauded what others have done. Uh, and I think this current administration has shown a real concern about human rights at home, about addressing some of the human rights problems we have at home, about seeing uh, a, an approach that, that involves more humility uh, as being important to restoring some degree of U.S. credibility in, ad, in uh, advancing uh, human rights around the world. And I think one reason why Zelensky has been so powerful and so um, uh, energizing for so many Americans is because he's appealing to these fundamental principles, the principle of human dignity, the principle of liberty and self-determination. And in the face of such egregious violations of those fundamental ideas in, in the face of such an egregious aggression and in the face of clear war crimes. Um, I think people are rising up in, in defense of those norms. And fortunately, we have law and we have institutions that can do something about it. That is a good reminder that we have a rich architecture to build on, um, going back to 1948, of course. Um, and I think um, I want to bring in others on the panel. Uh, so let me turn to Diane next and ask you, you know, you've written quite a bit on the special plight of children victimized 
by war and other crimes against humanity. And we're all seeing images of how this conflict is affecting uh, children who are on the run um, and suffering greatly. Um, I'm wondering if you could um, imagine how the ICC or other international accountability mechanism could pay special attention to to children and what kind of differentiated treatment you think they deserve. Yes, I'd be happy to talk about that. I I first need to thank Philippe for for a truly wonderful um, uh, intervention and state that uh, I think the the emphasis on a tribunal that would look only at aggression is really important in this moment. I feel that a line has been crossed here that is quite different than the line from Iraq, although I too wrote then that I was unpersuaded at the efforts to find legal justification. This is different, and um, it is not enough to say Uh, we should have done something 20 years ago. That's not an excuse not to do it now. And so I I do hope that that does go forward, and I would love to see the United States on that role. In fact, um, having had the privilege of serving as the first-ever special advisor to the International Criminal Court prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda, until 2021 on crimes against and affecting children, I guess the thing I would like to see the United States to do is to, I happen to be a dual national. Um, I am a national of one state party of the ICC, the Republic of Ireland. I would welcome my second state of nationality, the United States, to take that energy that the Senate uh, seemed to have had, the wind in their sails, to unanimously support investigations, albeit with some concern on my part, war crimes only on one side of the conflict. There seemed to be a misunderstanding of the duty of the prosecutor, the ICC. But to take this moment and think seriously about ratifying the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, that would do more than anything to begin to propel these things forward. Um, If not that, uh, Senator Durbin has just proposed legislation for the United States to expand the scope of national laws prohibiting crimes against humanity and increase jurisdiction over war crimes. I think it's high time that we do that. How will that help children? There is a tendency in moments like this to instrumentalize children, and I think in a way that is highly effective, but that we should feel concerned about. It's the face of the child refugee the child who is injured that is used by the media and policymakers to move our emotions and propel us to activity. That says something very bad about us, I have to say. That said, children have a different place as participants, whether victims or sometimes combatants, in um, conflicts. And it's really important to pay attention to their needs. The, the, the most common uh, reference is child soldiers, and indeed, it has probably received too much attention. Um, children are uh, victims of trafficking, victims of all kinds of violence, sexual and gender-based crimes, of course, but also maiming, killing, loss of families, loss of homes, loss of education, forced displacement, um, and because of their nature as being both vulnerable and capable in different ways as they grow, in being in this generation quite gender fluid and thus sometimes experiencing the harshness of conflict um, in in, uh, ways of persecution on account of their intersectional identities. Um, There is a need in our system to address their concerns alone. And I was very proud to have helped Prosecutor Bensouda promulgate the policy on children of the International Criminal Court Office of the Prosecutor, which was published in 2016. How does this relate to this conflict? And then I will return the floor. Um, What we are not seeing in this impressive web of uh, mechanisms that have been engaged, and Jane mentioned quite a bunch of them, 
is much attention on crimes against and affecting children. If you care about those faces, you have to insist that whether it's states, international organizations, non-governmental organizations that are engaged in the um, gathering of evidence with an eye to future prosecutions, you must insist that they have experts on their staff who are expert in crimes against and affecting children and that they are investigating those very difficult to investigate in crimes in real time. That is not happening. And one of the emblems where it's not happening is that the commission of inquiry that was established by the Human Rights Council, um, which I think is staffing up right now and in the process of appointing its commissioners, the terms of reference does not in a step back from prior similar institutions does not include a requirement of expertise or staffing on crimes against and, and affecting children, nor do any of the vacancy notices specify expertise in this area. So if you care about those faces you're seeing, we're going to need to pressure the international community um, to think about that particular issue. So I think that's a really critical point as we think about the victims of this conflict. I also want to think about um, how does one uh, address the problems of collecting evidence? When it comes to individual criminal responsibility, we have a high bar, as in any criminal proceeding, when it comes to the evidentiary standards. Um, and we hear many different reports of the Commission of Inquiry, the ICC prosecutors, Ukrainian prosecutors on the ground. Um, what do we need to do to make sure that evidence is collected in a way that is actually um, you know, admissible in a, in a court of law? So not surprisingly, I have just published on this. And um, one of the things that I have suggested is a second look at an institution that was established in, I think, 1943, even before the United Nations became an organization in 1945, the group we now think of as the Allies had begun to call themselves or refer to themselves as the United Nations. It included not only the big four, but another dozen or so others, um, not only in Europe, but also Latin America and Asia. And they came together in something that was called the United Nations War Crimes Commission. And they began a process of, of creating a central clearinghouse for investigation, um, a depository of information and a methodology of distributing and sharing information. So fragmentation is a great thing at the moment. However, uh, we have multiple entities who are going to get different bits and pieces of information, um, possibly without sufficient forensic authentic authentication, thus making it useless for those future trials. And to the extent that their jurisdictions are limited, an aggression tribunal, um, the European Court of Human Rights, which can only concern itself with, with violations of the human rights in its convention, et cetera, um, they may simply disregard the other evidence. And so I think what we need to think about, possibly through, through trained in how to validate, properly store uh, authenticate, record evidence, record witnesses now so they don't forget 20 years later, and also more importantly, to do it in a way that's safe for the informants. I have to say there are a number of non-governmental organizations that have become quite entrepreneurial, and I'm getting emails saying, upload your cell phone videos of war crimes to our app. Hmm. That's frightening particularly in a world of misinformation where all of us have been victims of phishing expeditions. When you click on the link, might you be clicking on a link to the Kremlin? If we don't have really careful, strenuous, um, uh, verifiable mechanisms for this particular task that's essential to all the uh, justice mechanisms that have been discussed here. Yeah, I think this is critical when you think about the information warfare underway and the doctored videos and whatnot. 
that each side is accusing the other of and how easy it would be for a defense counsel to exploit the contradictory evidence. So um, thank you for making that point. Sean, let me bring you in. As Philippe pointed out, your work with the uh, International Law Commission to create a specific treaty on crimes against humanity um, seems on the surface quite relevant to what's happening in Ukraine today, but it's really meant for situations that run short of armed conflict or, or genocide. So what impact do you think the conflict in Ukraine will have on the development? Will it create some political momentum for taking this up at, at the UN? Um, maybe explain again, what do we need this convention? Why do we need this convention? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Ted, for that uh, question. Mm-hmm. Thanks to the German and uh, Dutch governments for the invitation to be here in Brookings and all that. It's a great pleasure to be with Jane and Diane and, of course, Philippe, an old friend. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, as Philippe explained, I think when you look at what we call atrocity crimes, you've got mm-hmm. genocide, you've got war crimes, and you've got crimes against humanity. Um, we have a 1948 genocide convention. We have the 1949 Geneva Conventions that talk about the war crimes, and they've been supplemented by protocols. And we have no convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. We do have the Rome Statute, which sets up the International Criminal Court and allows for prosecutions of a limited number of people in The Hague. Uh, But even the Rome Statute is built on the idea of complementarity that in the first instance, we want prosecutions to happen at the national level. And yet, if you're going to do that, you need to build up national laws, national jurisdictions, in order to allow those prosecutions to take place so that they don't have to happen uh, in The Hague. We don't have a Convention on Crimes Against Humanity. We looked at the International Law Commission worldwide to find out how many countries have national laws on crimes against humanity, and the answer is about 40%. Even if you look at Rome statute parties, it's only about 50%, which is kind of surprising, but the Rome statute doesn't actually require you to adopt these national laws, but for perhaps the preambular clause that Philippe referred to in his comments. So we're in a situation where many countries, if an offender turned up in it, who we thought had committed crimes against humanity, there's no ability to prosecute them. And we're sitting in one of those countries. There's no federal or state law in the United States that criminalizes crimes against humanity. So what does the International Law Commission's project do? It creates a series of draft articles, 15 in total, plus an annex, that could form the basis for a new convention, like the Genocide Convention, but a little bit more sophisticated, actually, because we've learned a lot since 1948. Um, And it would require states to adopt national laws, exercise jurisdiction not only over their own nationals, but over non-nationals who turn up in its territory. So if you did have individuals who've committed crimes in Ukraine or in Sierra Leone or in China or wherever, and they turned up in the United States, the U.S. would be in a position to to proceed with uh, a prosecution. It also puts states that are parties to the treaty in an interstate cooperative uh, mode, which is kind of important for Diane's issue of gathering evidence, uh, sharing evidence, exchanging information. This type of a convention would create a mutual legal assistance relationship among countries, Uh, and also a relationship with respect to extradition of individuals. So it's a pretty important next step in filling a gap in this field of international criminal law. Uh, The ILC finished the work in 2019. Uh, It was about to be debated in New York. The pandemic hit. It messed everything up. Uh, they've kind of gotten back around to looking at it now. I think there will be a fairly significant discussion. Uh, It's happening already this this spring and summer, but in the fall. Uh, Will Ukraine feed into perhaps creating a greater impetus to make it happen? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'd like to think it drives home the value, particularly when you see countries like Germany that are already looking into crimes that are occurring in Ukraine. Well, wouldn't it be nice of all countries Uh, had this in mind as a a possibility, harnessing their national legal systems to look at 
whether or not crimes are committing somewhere and being prepared uh, if an offender turns up in their territory and certainly being prepared to share information with other states. So I'm hopeful that it moves forward, but it's in the hands of governments now in New York. Well, since Philippe really focused on the role of the United States, I'm wondering what is the U.S. position on your on the commission's proposal? Surely there's concern about um, Americans who, when traveling abroad, might be uh, accused of such um, crimes. And I'm uh, wondering, you know, more broadly, uh, the role of the U.S. is... Uh, very complicated in, in all of this. And if we um, rely just on, on the U.S., uh, we're probably not going to get very far. You know, I'm thinking about the Rohingya case that you referred to. It's the Gambia that has taken the lead on, on that. And that's quite interesting um, and could really be precedent setting in how that case goes forward. So, Sean, maybe you could touch on that. You've all touched on this one way or sure. the other, but right. maybe say another word, all of you, about the role of the U.S. And I'll come back to you, Philippe. Yeah, so specifically on, you know, support for this Crimes Against Humanity initiative, I think the good news is the U.S. is a party to the Genocide Convention. So we do have a Genocide Convention implementation statute in the U.S. The U.S. is a party to the 1949 Geneva Conventions. We have a War Crimes Implementation Act in the United States. In principle, it should be possible to take this further step uh, as well, at least you're not in any worse position than you are with respect to these other uh, crimes. I think the U.S., generally speaking, supports uh, building up national laws to deal with atrocities matters. So I'm not uh, overly concerned. And they have been cautiously supportive. I wouldn't say they're out in front on this particular project, but they have certainly not been saying things in opposition to it or blocking things or anything to that effect. And I've been Uh, Glad to see that. On the broader issue that Philippe introduced of, you know, sort of uh, uh, the U.S.'s uh, role in in sometimes supporting, sometimes not supporting, I guess I'll say a couple things. One is um, I'm not sure the core proposition of the U.S. at Nuremberg was a huge supporter in a way that it's not now is holds up. I mean, there aren't any Americans in the dock in Nuremberg, right? or in Tokyo, Uh, and to the extent that the U.S. at that point in time was saying we favor a tribunal that will prosecute Germans and Japanese, um, but not us, well, that's not so different (laughs) from today, maybe, right? So, you know, I'm not sure that comparison holds up. More broadly, I would say that the U.S. government's position, as I understand it, Um, is that the U.S. has a very robust national legal system that has incorporated lots of rules and lots of procedures for prosecutions of individuals for things like war crimes. Uh, They sometimes do that and they sometimes don't. I think Philippe quite properly pointed to the Guantanamo situation as a, a situation where you could raise real doubts if this system is fully operating the way it should. But I think the U.S. position, generally speaking, has been we have a national legal system. We have a uniform code of military justice. We're serious about these things. We train our soldiers not to commit war crimes. We develop military manuals, all those kinds of things, such that we think we can handle this at home. Mm -hmm. Now, you can disagree with that, right? But the idea is we think we can do it here. We don't need to have someone do it in The Hague. We're worried about possible politics playing out in The Hague. I mean, I think that's the general orientation. Um, And maybe that suggests some duplicity or some double standards, but it's possible that when it talks about other countries being exposed to the ICC, what it has in mind is they don't have the same kind of systems operating there. Uh, or that's the belief, that it's not, not as rigorous, not as built up, not as independent you know, judicial bodies and whatnot. Um, so I don't know if that's the case, but I think that's a big part of what the U.S. Uh, has, has thought about when it's thought about exposure to international criminal courts. Right. 
Jane, do you want to um, elaborate on your own views on, on the U.S. role in all this? And also maybe going back to the crime of aggression, which you didn't touch on in your comments, you know, whether you think the proposal here that Philippe has outlined is the way to go, or are there other thoughts on how to proceed? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. And, and Philippe, I commend you for your, um, your leadership on that uh, proposal for, um, for crime of aggression because the ICC does not have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression in this instance because uh, neither Russia nor Ukraine are state's parties and clearly Russia would veto any Security Council referral. So really there is a gap for this very fundamental crime and, and I actually think there are strong arguments for creating uh, a, a, a court that could address this particular uh, instance of aggression, both because of the prohibition against uh, aggressive wars at the cornerstone of the UN Charter. It's so fundamental to the whole order that was uh, built in, 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 uh, in 1945 and, and fundamental to that. And secondly, because there are a huge host of harms that are caused by an aggressive war that will never be prosecuted as part of war crimes or crimes against humanity. You know, mil combatants are lawful targets in, a, in an armed conflict, right? And just think of the number of Ukrainian soldiers who've been killed, who've been maimed. Think of the Russian soldiers, many of them young conscripts who were sent to this war on misleading basis, right? And so what, what, what remedy is there for that and for the, the horror, not only the crimes, um, um, uh, against uh, children that Diane was talking about, but also just the, the trauma, the displacement, all sorts of harm that will never be captured as part of a prosecution for uh, war crimes or crimes against humanity. So I think there are many good reasons to, to focus on aggression. Um, there's also a agreed definition. I mean, in 2010, right? There, there is an agreed definition that a, a war of aggression is a is a act of aggression, which by its um, gravity, scope, uh, character is a manifest violation uh, of the charter. And um, I guess I, I think this aggression is so clear-cut, is so egregious, is such a manifest violation that it really does warrant um, attention and um, <coughs> pursuit of prosecution. It's, this is not a gray area. They're not, they're not, there is not an arguable legal basis. And there are plenty of cases like that. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, I think I think um, the best way to do it, from my view, is to build from the ground up. The Ukrainians have this crime in their domestic legal code. They're investigating it with support from many other uh, European states. Um, and I think any any special court that would be set up to address it should should meet at least four criteria. It should have the consent of the Ukrainians. Uh, I think that's very very Im important. I think it should. Um, uh, use the agreed definition of the crime of aggression that's in the Rome Statute that, by the way, not only Rome Statute parties, but also Russia, the U.S., and other countries were involved in, in those negotiations. Third, I think it should have strong support from Europe. I'd like to see the Council of Europe engaged in this, um, and it should be located ideally in, uh, in Europe, um, given the threat to European security that is so clearly um, evident by this aggression. And fourth, and ideally, I'd like to see it endorsed by the UN General Assembly. Uh, I think that would help give greater um, uh, b legitimacy and bolster its international character. So I, I think this is a good idea. I think Philippe is right. The selectivity critique is a is one that will be made um, by con you know people will say, well, why not? Why are you doing it now and not in another situation? Um, and I think Philippe is also right that powerful states, including a number of members of the permanent five of the Security Council will be wary of the precedent that might be sent, set by this. But I think sometimes you just have to do the thing that's mm. right, <laughs> given the circumstances that you have and the space you have. Um, and I think, frankly, to not pursue it would set a precedent that would be even more disturbing. Yeah, I think that's a, a critical point there. Um, what will Russia get away with in, in this conflict and what damage that will do to the entire international legal order, I think, that we have to really uh, wrestle with. Diane, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add at this point before I give uh, Philippe the floor to comment on your own thoughts um, and wrap this up. Yeah. So, Sean, you and I could have a discussion, but another time, another place. Um, I, I would point out that uh, although the United States was not in the dock, it's quite clear that the participants at Nuremberg understood that they might have been 
As Philippe knows, I'm working on a book about women professionals, including some lawyers who uh, were participants in the first big trial. Their diaries, their conversations with each other re reveal severe concerns, mm -hmm. self-doubts about things like the dropping of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima, mm -hmm. the fact that they were living in a city, Nuremberg, that had been leveled by Allied carpet bombing. And so the relevance, the understanding that they were creating a precedent that could come back to them was palpable. Indeed, if we reread Robert Jackson's opening statement in, um, at the Nuremberg trial, mm -hmm. he says something to the effect of the chalice being passed. I can't remember the exact quote, but he says, we are setting a precedent which we ourselves one day may need to hold ourselves to. And perhaps this is the moment for the United States to take that chalice, chalice and accept the challenge that Robert Jackson laid down in 1945. Um, Philippe, I'd like you to comment on a lot of what you've heard here. And I also want to just, <laughs> another historical reference that we haven't heard um, is, is not the second Iraq war, but the first one. Yeah. Another very flagrant violation of the UN Charter that really did rally a huge international consensus on how to respond to, including massive military action, which is not happening in the case of Ukraine, even though it's also a flagrant violation. I just want to add that to the mix of the discussion, um, but ask you to just take the, the remaining three or four minutes to touch on whatever you'd like of what you've heard. <laughs> Thanks for that tremendous offer, Ted. Um, actually, I think the first, the first Iraq war, um, I mean, 1990, 1991, I don't think there's a real legal uh, issue. I think most people were comfortable. It was authorized by the Security Council. I don't think there was any issue. I've really enjoyed the conversation. I mean, we're the three fantastic commentators. And what's great about an event like this is it, it should be a debate. I mean, we need to be a broad church. The function of a place like Brookings is precisely to tease out the issues. I think you've all understood that my own position in relation to what's going on in Ukraine is of devastation. And, and I will go to the end of the earth to see that justice is done. And I will encourage and seek the support of the United States and the United Kingdom and every other country to do it. What I'm trying to inject into the debate, and in a sense it's a self-interrogation, is that we not be complacent about what is going on here. Why am I... Why did I put pen to paper so quickly after the Ukraine thing happened? Why does it feel so very personal to me? And it comes back to the beginning of my lecture. Mm -hmm. I know Ukraine. I know Lviv. I was in Kiev in September for the 80th anniversary of Babi Yar. I have lots of friends in Ukraine. I've been there with Sean. We did the unveiling. It was hugely touching of, of the, the, the plaques to Louis Sohn, to... to Raphael Lemkin to Herschel Autopact. So it feels immensely personal and, 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 and it weighs on me in ways that are bigger than any other. And then I have to ask myself, why is it weighing on me and why am I acting as I'm acting in relation to this, but I didn't act like that in relation to Syria or I didn't act like that in relation to other situations. And I think we have to be honest, each of us, that we are naturally affected in particular ways, once it's in our own back garden, so to speak. And for me, Lviv is a back garden. It's the place where my grandfather was born. It's a place that I've been to twice a year for each of the last 10 or 12 years. But I feel that it's right to interrogate myself on my own failings. I was pretty silent on Syria. You know, this has all happened in a really nasty way. We've been here before. And I suppose I'm really irritated with myself. I mean, I had a role with Paul Riker in the 2008 case for Georgia against Russia, a case which the court rejected jurisdiction, a dreadful decision. I thought it was dreadful at the time, and I, I think it's dr even more dreadful today because it was a moment for the court to say, this won't do, we're going to investigate, we're going to look into this. Um, similarly, the judgment in Democratic Republic of Congo in Uganda, where the court found a violation of Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter, a manifest violation. And it was invited by Congo, I was counsel for Congo, to conclude that this was an act of aggression and that crime of aggression had been committed. And it declined to do so. 
There are two very strong separate opinions by judges Al Arabi and Simmer. And really, it declined to do so in the context of Iraq. That was really why it, it was another lost opportunity. So we are where we are on this issue. I completely agree with you, Jane. You've understood what I'm trying to do. I, I, I want something to happen. But in wanting something to happen, I think we have to be cognizant. And this comes, in a sense, to a point you've made, Sean, that we've talked about a lot, is, is the lopsided nature of international law. I think Diane's right. I think I spent so much time in the, in the 1945 material. I know it intimately well, including the letters home and the diaries. And there wasn't any sense that we're just creating these rules for others. There was a clear sense that this is not something we would do. And if we do it, we will be held to that account. Um, and that was the spirit of 1945. And that was the spirit of 1941 and Roosevelt's remarkable creation of the rules that would dismantle the British Empire. But, of course, it's taken a different direction. There's an elephant in the room here, I think, that needs to be addressed, not now because we don't have time. And, and that is the question of race and difference. Yeah. Um, one of the most distressing things these days is to go onto the website of the International Criminal Court and look at all the individuals who have been indicted. And you will see that every single one of them is black and from Africa. Okay? Black people from Africa don't have a monopoly on international crime. Something has gone very wrong. I don't know quite why it's gone wrong. There's been a series of well-intentioned characters running the ICC. But how could that be that 25 years after the ICC was created, we are in that uh, situation? And it's the same in the relation to refugees. We've all noticed. I don't know. I can speak about Britain. I don't know how it's been in the United States. Britain opens its doors and its arms to refugees from Ukraine. Right. Did that happen with Syria? No. Did it happen with Afghanistan? No. So I think we have to be honest about ourselves as we've constructed institutions and rules and structures in which we have permitted a sort of lopsided approach. And that lopsided approach is premised upon a perception of difference between others. I heap my critique on myself. I didn't act in relation to Syria, and I should have. And it's a valid critique of my own students that I was silent on that issue. But when large numbers of blonde people with blue eyes suddenly find themselves under attack, Sands goes to the barricades. Mm -hmm. That's a relevant critique. I have to interrogate myself about that. I felt that immensely strongly. A few weeks ago, I was with Ambassador Kunjul, who is here from Mauritius, on a first ever visit by Mauritius to the Chagos Archipelago in the context of the legal proceedings before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And we were accompanied, we were a delegation of 25, and we were accompanied by five members of the Chagossian community, Mauritians, who were returning to the islands where they were born and from where they were forcibly removed. One of them was 11 months old when she was forcibly removed as a contract labourer to justify her removal. And I will never forget the moment that they got off that boat and landed on Peros Banos and held hands. And one of them, Olivier Banco amongst them, made a little speech. And he said, he expressed his gratitude to many people, to the government of Mauritius, to the judges of the International Court of Justice, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the members of the UN General Assembly for taking steps that made it possible for him to return. We would not have been there but for the system of the rules of international law. So let's look on the bright side. And he then said, but I must not forget that none of this would have happened to me if I was blonde and blue-eyed. And that is the reality. You look at the comparison between the Falkland Islands, Malvinas on the one side, and the Chagos Archipelago on the other side. 
What's the difference? There is only one difference. And I think what I'm trying to inject into the <coughs> conversation, including in relation to my own engagement with it, is just a, a recognition that as we go forward, let us listen to other voices in the design of new rules, the implementation of existing rules. Let us not overly commend ourselves on our own contribution to the rule of law, to our commitment to the rule of law, even to our own national legal systems. I agree with you, as you know, Sean. One of the most distressing... Last word. ...is um, what happened after 2001 in relation to the mistreatment of Muslims who were subjected to the most terrible torture systematically on a widespread basis across the world, including at Diego Garcia. So that's the purpose of my remarks. Let us absolutely go forward with the rule of law model. But let's be honest about our own failings and let's improve ourselves in how we address them and hold ourselves to the same account to which we wish to hold others. Very powerful final words. In a nutshell. There was one, sorry, one final thing I wanted to say. I meant to say it at the beginning. I just want to pay tribute to Justice Breyer. This is a lecture. I had I'd written out the notes, and I, I, I had just not mentioned it, and I feel I can't let the morning pass without paying tribute to his service as a scholar and as a justice of the United States Supreme Court who was always open to the place of international rule in interpreting the Constitution of the United States. And that is not something one can say about all the justices of the United States. And in this particular context, I just want to thank him for what he has done to take the debate forward on the interpretation of the Constitution of this remarkable country and its engagement with the rules that exist beyond. Here, here. Um, I don't think I could ever have made it into it. If I had made it into it, I would have been thrown out very quickly. Um, I thought that this was a truly remarkable lecture and a remarkable debate. And we, it is a sort of platitude, a trope of such discussions to say that one could have gone on for a very long time. But I think we are probably in agreement that in this, that this case, it is true that we could have gone on for a very long time. And I hope that we will revisit these issues. Um, I am grateful for Philippe's insistence that we need to look at our own standards, our own double standards, our hypocrisies. I will say, though, however, having also, as a journalist, covered the Iraq War and Afghanistan, that um, the Taliban did, of course, give cover to al-Qaeda, and that Saddam did attack his neighbors, use chemical weapons. Um, And Ukraine has done none of that. Ukraine is genuinely a clear-cut case of, of aggression. And so while it is useful to look at our own behavior, and I think that is particularly important as in the prosecution of a political, economic, military resolution to this dreadful conflict, which, as you say, is deeply personal for so many of us, as we seek allies beyond the West, I think it's important that we were reminded today of some of the reasons why the global South hangs back and that if we want to have their support, we should perhaps address these issues more forthrightly in the way that we speak about the conflict, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. With that, I'm going to shut up and let you all go out into the sunlight and the weekend. Thank you so much for joining us here in the room and online. Thank you for our supporters from the municipality and the Hague and the Dutch embassy, and to my colleagues who did all the work on this while I was happily you know, traveling around Europe. Um, that is Agnes Bloch, who isn't here, Lucy C.V., um, Natalie Britton, um, everybody else at the Center on the U.S. and Europe, and at Brookings in the Tech Department and the Comms Department. Uh, many of you sitting there, others are outside the room. Thank you for doing this. We couldn't have done it without you. And thank you all for coming. Thanks. 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 Thanks.